And we are live. We are live. Hello, the internet. <laughs> I'm silencing my cell phone. That's, that's a good idea. Yeah. We don't want any interruptions. Um, yeah, hi. Hey, before we get started, uh -huh. we should just kind of allow a little time for people to, to join the stream. But um, do you have any jokes? Jokes. <laughs> I was not prepared for this. <laughs> do I have any jokes? Uh, let's see. OK. I got one. It's, 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 this is kind of risque. I hope I don't offend anybody. <laughs> no, out there. don't do risque. Why, why did the cactus cross the road? The cactus. Uh huh. Why? It got stuck to the chicken's butt. <laughs> <laughs> That's the stupidest joke. All right. My four-year-old loves that one, so that that kills it. Home. That's a really good one. Um, I had a lead singer joke, but I can't oh, remember fine. it. <laughs> oh, I have a lead singer joke. <laughs> okay. What? How do you know when a singer is at your door? How? They don't have the key, and they don't know when to come in. <laughs> <laughs> that was my joke. That was the exact one. <laughs> Did I take one. your joke? Uh, yeah, well, no, but I, I remember could, it I couldn't for remember you. it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> That's great. It's osmosis. Joke osmosis is happening. All right. I think we're ready to start now. Are we? Cool. <laughs> well, enough, enough shenanigans, everybody. Uh, welcome to our, our live broadcast. We're excited on this Thursday afternoon to get on the internet and hopefully share some knowledge with you. Um, uh, specifically, we want to talk a little bit about... Wait, you have wait. to introduce yourself. I do. You have no <laughs> idea who I am. I'm not... I'm bad at this. I'll get it. I'll get it. Okay. So, hi. I am Jason Fernandez. I'm a, a live sound training specialist here at QSC. And sitting in the studio with me here is Brad Zell. Hello. Brad Zell, go ahead and give yourself a little introduction. <laughs> I work in the marketing department and uh, in our live sound group. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, that's about it. Yeah. So we are uh, we are in we we work a lot with uh, live sound marketing here at QSC. Yeah. Um, and me being in the more educational side of it, we thought we'd hop on here and try to teach you a couple things in the next twenty minutes or so. So wait, one one thing I want to just give Dean Butler kudos. Is he on right now? Because uh, he found the stream when we scheduled it. Yep. And then he's listed like four or five, posted four or five he, he questions posted, already. He posted sort of a, a single question outlined uh, very succinctly in five different posts. On YouTube, which is really cool. Super cool. Um, I guess we should basically read his questions and um Yeah, let's and, try, and let's try to take this question. Dean, so hopefully you're watching. Uh, we're going to go ahead and dive right into your questions here. Oh, and also just quick note. Um, yes, he says yes. Well, hello, um, uh, please, anyone, feel free to post questions, comments. Um, we we are seeing both Facebook and um, YouTube comment windows, so let us know where you're tuning in from, and feel yeah. free to ask questions. Yeah, please ask away. We'll we'll try to be as responsive as we can, <laughs> um, and we'll we'll address as many questions on camera as we can, and maybe we'll um, kind of reply in the chat where necessary as well. But uh, okay, so Dean is asking. Um, well, he says, okay, so he plays in an acoustic duo, and he's got a TouchMix 8 and two K12.2s. Fantastic setup. Uh, and he's using um, an AER Domino 3 amplifier to plug in two acoustic guitars. Um, so he's asking for a little bit of advice on some EQ and compression settings for the female lead vocal and his backup vocals, as well as some EQ and compression settings for uh, the acoustic guitars, which it looks like he has plugged into a single channel using a DI. Um, so we'll go ahead and address some of that stuff now. And I think as far as the, the EQ and the compressor settings, those, we'll address some of that actually throughout the, the main part of this lesson. So yeah. we'll hold off on that for now, but I think... Let, let, let me just, I think the best way to uh, approach this question is to really use the presets that are in the touch mix. Absolutely. And so what, what I would advise, Dean, I think you have a killer rig. The amp, I, I'm not super familiar with that exact amp, but the AER amps are great for acoustic guitars. So you plug your and um, if you can go direct out of each guitar into two inputs on the mixer, um, then you'll use your amp for stage monitoring for your guitars, and then um, with your K, you know, put your K12s up and connect the main outs of your mixer to the to the touch mix, yep. um, to the K12s, or you could have one speaker on a speaker stand and one speaker as a floor monitor. Yeah. So you could listen back to yourselves uh, that way. Yeah. Um, 
And then what I would do is simply for the you know the vocals, I would select male vocal preset and load that. Let's, um, let's take a look. And then the female vocal preset and load that for your female vocalist. Yep. Right and then there. for the Male guitars, you go direct out from your amp, get that sound good, go direct out from your amp. That generally will be post EQ from your amp CQ. So once you so once just know that that's happening. And then um, in the touch mix, you could do a simple low cut filter mm -hmm. on those guitars, or you could also play with the uh, guitar acoustic guitar presets yeah. and load those. So taking a look at a channel, you know, just get your low cut filter and kind of dial that in until you find kind of the, the sweet spot of, of how much you need to remove out of those low frequencies. Um, or, you know, come over to the presets and under frets, uh, we've got acoustic guitar, we've got a number of different acoustic guitar presets. Um, so I would, as Brad said, I would advise you to, to start there. Um, the, the presets are fantastic. They're, they're actually, they're one of the most powerful parts of this mixer and I find that they're oftentimes overlooked. Um, so for that reason, we want to tell you a little bit more about them. Uh, yeah, and let me, just, let me also just add, with a new system, um, I would just recommend setting it up in your rehearsal space or in your, you know, in your garage or wherever you can set it up and just carve out, carve out a lot of time yeah. to like, to play with stuff and to, to listen to stuff and to demo stuff and actually, um, practice. Cause, cause yeah, practice using it. So, I mean, we're happy to, to give you as much advice and information as we can and tips and tricks and things and things like that. But, um, audio and mixing sound is the same thing as playing an instrument. It takes time and it takes practice and, um, yeah, every it's, it's a craft. Every room's different. Um, the audiences are different. Like it, there's, there's everything changes all the time. So you might, you might be tweaking things differently at every gig. Every time, yeah. Yeah. And so. you might be tweaking things kind of periodically throughout a single performance. You know, as you know, different physical elements and elements and dynamics of your environment change and things like that. So, um, yeah. Right, so, hopefully that helps, <laughs> Deed. And if you have more questions, and anyone, if you would like to send a question via email. You can send one to social at qse.com, and I'll get that. And um, if I can't answer it, I'll try to He'll get an answer for you. Kick it to me, and if I can't answer <laughs> yeah. it, I'll find somebody else. We'll find somebody. Somebody yeah. knows the answer. Yeah. Um, great. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. We do have a couple other good let's, questions let's attack, in here. Let's, let, let's tackle these questions um, a little bit later. Let's yeah, get think, into this, because I think we're going to cover some of, the, some of the answers. Absolutely. Let me turn myself down a little bit. Okay. Um, so, as I said, uh, the presets, presets on the touch mix are, are incredibly powerful um, and uh, somewhat overlooked. I, I don't feel like a lot of people understand just how powerful they are. Um, but to set them up a little bit, um, the presets on touch mix were developed over a period of many months. Um, I think said that the better part of a year uh, went into the de just the development of these presets and the process was... Um, it's pretty incredible, uh, and I don't think it's ever been done as far as any kind of preset creation within audio anyway. Um, so what we did, uh, we hired real musicians, and we had them bring real instruments into different size rehearsal rooms and performance spaces and performance halls. Um, we would set up uh, three different size PAs in, kind of in each one of those environments. We have the player play for a few minutes. Um, we would go in there and we'd tweak the settings, and we would get it to sound great out of that one PA. And then we'd move them to the next PA in the same room, listen to that, make some more tweaks and fine tune it a little bit more for that one, and then move them back to the original PA and hear what, what the, our new changes did to that. And then go to the third one, and it was just this repeating kind of back and forth stepped process of finding the best results that would serve um, many different size PA systems within many different size venues. Uh, so what you end up with are channel settings, um, that get you, uh, we like to say, at least at the minimum 80% of a complete channel setup. Uh, depending on what it is, depending on where you are, what, what the timbre of the particular instrument is, what room you're in, maybe it's great. Maybe you, you recall that preset and it's dead on. It's exactly what you need it to sound like. Um, 
That that's probably more on the rare side, but you know, our claim is it's going to give you at least 80%. That's a giant head start. And if you are a novice um, or, or brand new even to mixing, you know, the preset is going to give you a completely usable sound immediately. It's a press of a button and it's going to recall settings that are tailored and that are, that are built for that instrument that you're trying to get to create in your mix. Um, and they're also designed to work together within a mix. Um, so that is another really key element of these yeah. things. You can really use presets to build a complete mix and it's going to work. It's going to sound good. Now maybe you, you would want to go in and make some fine tuning or make some fine tuning because I can talk. Uh, fine, <laughs> fine tune some things from there to kind of really dial it in and get it to sound really, really sweet. Um, but it's going to work no matter what. And if you are a novice, if, you, if you're a veteran or if you, if you have a lot of experience with this kind of thing, it's a giant head start. It's a time saver. Um, so. There you go, that's kind of my, my quick pitch on the presets here. And we're gonna go ahead and actually show you a couple of the presets on the mixer. We've picked out five presets that we're gonna kind of walk through and um, deconstruct the settings a little bit and kind of offer a little, uh, some explanation on why they are the way they are and, and what they're gonna do to your sound. Um, sound good? That sounds good. Okay. I wanted to also add, um, so in the EQ setting process, we had multiple um, bands Mm -hmm. different types of bands playing as well so it's you know most of the time when presets are created they're created in a studio environment yeah. and they're um they're not dealing with uh live monitors on the on the stage no yeah it's very they're, controlled you know, so so these are created to deal with real live situations where you're dealing you know you have monitors you have yeah multiple mics open and stuff like that. So that's, stuff, that's one stuff of the- Stuff can feed back in real time. Yeah, that's right. one of the reasons why these, these work great. And so, the, um, so we're, we're gonna also do, as we look at these presets, try to explain and give you guys some information on, um, as far as the EQ goes, frequencies and why things are cut or boosted. Um, and then with compression, um, so just, uh, little description on compression, how it works, mm -hmm. and why compression settings are, um, are chosen and, uh, for, these, for these presets. Right. And hopefully it'll kind of give you just a little bit more of an understanding of general EQ and compression yeah. um, overall. And, and maybe uh, understanding kind of how we arrived at these settings might help you to kind of find your, your settings or find your starting point if you're trying to do this on your own or if you're trying to you know f use a preset and then fine tune from there even kind of understand you're like okay where do i go from there what how do i know what to do if i want to fine tune these this sound or this element so so in a touch mix preset when i select a preset mm -hmm. what is what is preset on the so, channel, basically. Great question. So the preset is going to give you, uh, first and foremost, an EQ curve. Um, so the, the probably the primary tool in audio mixing is your EQ, your equalization. Um, and that is going to kind of shape and, and, and carve out the signal a little bit. It's gonna eliminate some, some parts that you don't want or don't need or, or problematic. Um, and then it can also maybe kind of boost and accentuate um, the, the the presence or, or, or the, the, the kind of the important, the body of whatever the sound is that you're trying to fit into the mix. And so um, for like the ultra beginners or yeah. novices, EQ is kind of your lows, your yep. low frequencies, your deep kind of bass, like on a, a stereo, you have yep. your bass you or your the bass lows, knob, right. your mids and your highs. Uh -huh. And um, they're represented by frequencies. Yep. And the lower the number, the lower the tone. Yep. And the higher the number, the higher the, higher the tone. The so if, yeah. if you can imagine, um, if I'm talking, my voice is is basically covering a lot of different frequencies because there's some high aspects of it and a little bit of low aspects of it. So, um, you know, on the frequency curve, my voice is kind of covering what like 500 hertz or 200 hertz yeah. up to like uh, 5k, -ish. Yeah. and then the tss -tss -tss, that little that's sibilance is kind of like 8k, like, uh, eight, yeah, eight to ten. So, so we're gonna kind of break down these EQ curves and the compression settings. And when we look at the EQ, you'll be able to kind of see that laid out visually. Uh, so let's do that. I'm gonna go ahead and go back over to our mixer view here. I'll pop us in the corner so you can still see us. Um, okay, so the first thing we wanna talk about is a vocal microphone preset. And I might got my cable in the way here. So we do have our SM58 connected to a channel on here. Pretty common mic. Very common uh, <laughs> vocal mic. I have a bunch. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I've got this connected into channel three on my mixer here. 
I'm gonna go ahead and just enter into this channel. Oh, and I've already kind of, we've already tweaked with it a little bit. I'll pop that off. Um, I'm gonna go straight from the EQ to the presets here. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go straight to the presets. I'm gonna recall my preset and we're gonna see what it did to the channel here. So I'm gonna select the vocals and speech instrument type. And then in my type column, I'm gonna keep it um, with the music setting for now. And I'm gonna go ahead and just select the uh, male, vocals male comp preset. Now the comp is indicative of a compressor setting as well. So all of the, the presets give you an EQ curve. And then additionally, it may or may not give you some compressor settings or gate settings. And we'll, we'll talk more about that as we look at more of these here. So I'm just gonna recall this one. I'm gonna get this going. I'm gonna hit recall. I'm gonna confirm that. And now I know that I have recalled this because it's telling me that in the preset name field there. So if I go back and look at my EQ curve, there we go. So that is the EQ curve that it gave my microphone here. And That's the male vocal preset. The male vocal EQ preset. EQ curve. That's it. <laughs> I'm going to now mute my live for a second and talk through this so we can kind of hear what it's going to sound like. Yeah. Keep this up. Hey, hey, hey. OK. So here's my like voice. It? Come, it sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah. All right. I can deal with this. Uh, let's go back in here and take a look at this EQ, EQ curve now. OK, so. Um, the thing I, I want to point out first is we have a low cut. Um, so this is extremely important uh, for a voice in particular, as well as for many other things. Um, just any time that you're working with a sound that is, doesn't have intentional low end, like a bass guitar or a kick drum or low synth sounds and things like that, you want to go ahead and give it that low cut because you don't need those lower frequencies in the microphone. It's going to cut out a lot of mud and a lot of... Um, Mud. <laughs> Mud woofiness. Woofiness, yeah. Like so, low-end rumble. And, and that um, alone. Like woo woo woo. Right. So, so this, is, this is a tip for if, if your guys are not hip to this, but any channel that's open on stage, you should cut the lows. Cut the lows. On all of them. Everything. Except for maybe kick drum, yep. um, bass guitar, yep. and maybe synth. If you have the the person's really playing a lot of bass synth, but yeah. if it's like a, a regu regular digital keyboard, I think our our preset I think it has, yeah. also if we have rolls, time, we can rolls take a off the lows. But, but it rolls off at some point. But that that creates just a much cleaner mix it cleans in, it in, up. in the low end. And yeah, and it brings a lot more intelligibility to not only the channel, but if you've got these low low cut filters on. Just, just about everything, it's going to really bring a lot of clarity and intelligibility to your whole mix. Yeah. So that alone can help a lot. Um, on top of that, on the other end of it, um, we do not have the high cut engaged. So we're allowing you know, all of our higher ends of the frequencies to, to come through. But we do have a slight cut right in this region right here. Brad, do you want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, so um, in, right around 2K, can be a harsh frequency. It's, yeah. It can be harsh for electric guitars and it can be harsh for vocals. Um, so if you have a singer that has that sort of presence in their voice, mm -hmm. like I've, we, um, I know of a couple people that when they're really laying into it, they're, if, if 2K is not cut, it sounds harsh and shrill. Shrill, yeah. So, so I, I tend to, um, those types of vocalists uh, just cut a little bit at 2K, and that's kind of where this... That's where this is. So we've got this at 2.6, or the preset has this at 2.6. Um, we've also got a little bit of 4.8. So between 2.6 and 4.8, we're kind of scooping out, attenuating those regions a little bit, and that's exactly why. It's going to eliminate um, the possibility of any of that kind of harshness that can occur, uh, particularly with vocals, and, you know, with, especially with... And, um, a more but that's sibilance and spitty, sibilance, yep. the spittiness, and a lot of times it's like this harsh. I I, I think of it as like a, bad. a biting sound. You don't want it. Where it, it kind of just hurts your ears. Right. Um, but yeah. then you know after that area we're 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 not completely rolling off all those highs, and that is to kind of maintain um, what a lot of people refer to as kind of air or that kind of, that sparkle. Kind of a, that it's at the very very top end. You know, it's not within this region where we're we're getting the harshness. It's above that. Um, and that can add uh, just a lot, a lot of nice top end kind of sheen to the sound of it. And um, it can also help to keep the intelligibility um, really well maintained, kind of by allowing those upper frequencies to shine through. And then um, we've got another, a small little cut 
just after the, the low cut that's, sh that's shaving off all of that there just to kind of tame the, the lower mid sections a little bit. And really what that does is it kind of focuses on this section here. So what, what, really what we want to hear out of a male vocal in particular with this preset is this range right in here. So that is what we would call the presence of that channel or that sound. Yeah, the majority of the frequencies for male vocal yeah. land in that range. Land right there. So by yeah. kind of cutting in around that region, um, we can both accentuate those frequencies in this channel and make room in the overall mix for other things that might reside around those frequencies. Yeah. So um, cool. So that's kind of a little deconstruction on the EQ curve here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and show the compressor just for a, a second here as well. Um, and you'll see, actually, let's do one fun thing here. Since I am talking into this mic, I'm going to go ahead and just bypass that curve there. So you should, you should actually hear um, a difference. So hopefully the way my voice sounds right now, so the EQ curve is turned off. So the microphone channel is completely open versus... You hear a difference, I right? do hear a difference. So I, I, I'm monitoring this myself, so I can through, definitely hear going it. Going through cyberspace and then landing on someone's computer <laughs> speakers, they might not produce the lows that you're it's, cutting. No, if, you're, if you are listening to on desktop monitors or laptop <laughs> speakers, um, you're, you're not going to hear much of a difference in the lower re registers. Um, but like, even in this section here, if I pop that back on, yeah, there's, there's a noticeable timbral difference to my voice with the EQ on versus off. So that's pretty fun. Um, now, uh, our compressor, I uh, just wanted to kind of point out some of these settings really quick, because uh, these are um, fairly common settings for a compressor that is compressing a voice. Um, first of all, we've got our threshold here, which is set at negative 26.6. That's the setting that the preset gave us. Um, and you can see with that setting here, as I'm talking, you can see that the gain reduction is, is pretty significant. So it's, it's pretty much kind of compressing me to some degree every time I speak and then, and then backing off every time I'm not speaking. And that's more or less what you want in a musical setting, maybe not so much in a speech setting, which is what I'm doing, and we'll talk about that with our next preset. Um, but definitely in a musical setting, you kind of want that, that compressor to be, to be kind of an engaging more or less throughout. Not and then, like all the time. No, not heavy compression. And actually, since we're listening to yeah. this, let's just uh, take this down to a, a pretty extreme degree. And you should hear as I continue to talk, 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 what's that's doing. So you see on our, our compression meter here, our gain reduction meter, that is heavily in the red at all times. And you can hear what it's doing to my voice. It's, uh, it's, it's giving a lot of attenuation to the overall channel and kind of just making it sound a little crushed and harsh and unnatural. That's yeah, so not let, really let's, what you want. let's just give a quick definition of compression and the different parameters. Absolutely. So, so you have a threshold. Uh-huh. I actually saw a great meme on this today, but basically oh, it's like I saw did the you see same that one? meme, yeah. I can't repeat it, but if you remember, it's like what it's your funny. mother look anyway. up look up compression explanation meme, you'll probably find it. Yeah, but anyway, you have a, a, a threshold. Yeah. And that's set at which when do you want compression to when happen? When do you want to start compressing this signal? And so compression is an automatic volume adjustment. Adjustment, yeah. Yeah. So that when the, the, the signal goes into the compressor, if it goes above the threshold... Yes, then, then, the, then the threshold, uh, the compressor engages the signal that is o over that threshold and starts to compress it down to bring it back closer to the threshold. Now, um, it's important to understand that with a compressor, the, that threshold is not a hard line. It's not a limit. That's actually a, what a limiter is doing. Um, a compressor is simply just t taming or lessening the volume of the part of the signal that is exceeding that threshold. And that is determined by your ratio here. So the ratio is the amount of compression being applied. And these two parameters in conjunction fully explain what a compressor is doing and how it's doing it. So you have our threshold. That's determining at what point we start to compress, and the ratio determines how much we're, we're compressing. And the ratio, um, the way to read the ratio is, um, so at a three to one, which is what I have here, that means that every three dB that signal exceeds the threshold, the compressor is going to compress it to a single dB. So it's still going over the threshold, but just by one dB instead of three dB. So it's just softening, it's taming <laughs> that, right? right? Yeah, that it's so, it seems so complicated, but why in the world is this? It's because when when we when we are you know 
being expressive mm -hmm. and, and, and singing and stuff like that, yeah. there needs to be still dynamic volume changes. Yes. Um, or else, or it or sounds else, unnatural. Yeah, unless, and then it just sounds like every, you know. It sounds like a slam. So yeah. you, you don't want to fully eliminate the natural volume fluctuations in your sound. You just want to compress them. You want your, your highest highs and your lowest lows to be a little bit closer together so that you can better manage the overall loudness of that signal yeah. in your mix. So That's you can, what we're you doing. can boost the all the dynamic range yes. a little yes. bit higher so that it can just be a little bit louder before so the whole it clips. Thing sits a little yeah. higher and you and we're not yeah, we're not worried about <laughs> clipping or getting yeah. too loud. Yeah. Um, cool. So there you go. So th this is um, these are the compressor settings that you get with that the standard male vocal preset. Yeah. Um, they're, they're three to one is very typical for pretty, vocals. Yeah. Four to one I've seen. Um, Four to one is a little heavier, but usually between two point five and three, a little over three is mm. is very common. Yeah. Okay. Um, that takes care of that, I think. Yes. Should we move on. One thing I wanted to mention, um, if let's before we do the next preset is. Um, there's something if you if you're interested in the in engineering and sound engineering like like the details of this stuff, um, there are so many tools on the internet that you can learn about in greater detail. Um, one of which is called an EQ frequency chart. Yes. Okay. So I just googled EQ frequency chart and found this one. Um, there you go. <laughs> it's very colorful, but but you can see the piano keyboard. And then across the very bottom shows you the frequency numbers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think from 20 hertz to 20k. Uh, and then, and then on each line, it shows you different instruments or different um, things that make sound that cover different frequencies. So, when you're kind of wondering, okay, I'm dealing with a kick drum or I'm dealing with a trumpet now or mm -hmm. a violin. What frequencies are those covering um, these kind of charts? You can kind of study them. They and, can, yeah. And you can kind of They'll learn. help you find, you know, <laughs> where where you need to be focusing, you know, to try to, to to fix whatever you're trying to fix, essentially. Yeah. So, so yeah. anyway, look look that, look that up. <laughs> those are really helpful. Okay, continuing on, uh, we're going to look at one more uh, vocal preset before we move on to a couple of instrument presets, and we'll move through this one a little bit more quickly. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to show you the preset we have in here for the lavalier microphone. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just go, whoops, go How right How does it in sound? It sounds great. Okay. It sounds pretty good. I mean, I, I, sound, <laughs> like, uh, I sound like me <laughs> talking. Um, so this is found, I'll just show you, even though I had, have it recalled. This is found in the same, in the vocals, whoops, you can't see what I'm doing. There we are. So um, just to get back into this. So I'm going to go into my lavalier channel, and I'm going to go to the presets. So in the same vocals and speech category, uh, we're going to look in the speech type versus the music type. And in here we have four different presets that are categorized by different microphone types that are commonly used for speech application versus uh, a singing or a musical performance. Um, we've got handheld, head mic, lavalier, and podium. I'm going to go ahead and show you the lavalier preset, which I actually already have recalled, and you're listening to it right now. Mind blown. So I am wearing, we're both wearing uh, lavalier microphones, and that's lavalier how we're, we're speaking to you over the broadcast. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and, and show you the EQ curve for our lavalier preset, and it is, it's pretty jarring when you first see it. So there, here we go. This is the EQ curve for our lavalier preset. Now compared to what we just saw in the vocal, the male vocal preset, this is a lot different. This is a lot more aggressive. Um, we are cutting out a significant amount of just about everything, really, realistically. Um, so here again, I'll draw attention to the, the low cut. We've got a, a pretty Pretty hardy low cut there. We got it cut all the way, cut off at 120. We also have a high cut engage. So as opposed to uh, our musical application vocal preset, where we allowed the the highs to kind of stay stay straight, uh, we've got that that high cut filter, you know, uh, sitting right about 5k. We've got about 5.4. So we're cutting out a good portion of the highs in this one. We're also scooping out a giant part of the mids here, um, and then you know the the parts. Of the frequencies or the frequencies that the EQ is focusing on, even these these bumps here are pretty heavily attenuated. You can see the zero line, the unity line there. So they're sitting, you know, six seven dB, you know, below unity here. So there's, so everything is being very very heavily EQ'd and controlled. Um, and you know, looking at it, it looks pretty extreme. It looks pretty intense. But you, listening to it, it actually works. You know, it sounds fine. And the reason for that is kind of twofold. Um, one a lavalier microphone um, 
generally is very, very live. It has, it has a very, very robust pickup pattern in it. So what's going to happen is, you know, when you when really you only want it to do is kind of pick up the sound of the person's voice that's talking right in front of it. Um, it it'll do that, but it's also going to pick up a whole bunch of atmosphere and, and background noise and you know room tone and HVAC and stuff like that. So you, you know what I was just thinking about when I'm looking at the lavalier mic. Yeah. So it's pointing at the underside of his chin, right? And um, and the lavalier pattern is omnidirectional. Omnidirectional. So, right? so it's it's, it's, going it's picking up like pretty much everything, yeah. and it's and it's its distance is pretty far. Too. Yeah. It, it's so. Like when it's listening, it's listening to to a good to every single thing, yeah. And then like it's sitting under your chin, so you're you're trying to get the best vocal, you know, vocal realistic vocal sound, right? With with an omni mic that's on a shirt under someone's chin, um, so so it's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's it, they're they're <laughs> they're traditionally challenging to try to tame in a mix, um, and so this is what we we came up with. And just to, to demonstrate. Like how good this works. I'm gonna turn this off right now, and you're gonna immediately hear, boom, listen to that. So you can hear a lot more of the room noise. You can hear, uh, doesn't sound like the HVAC is on now, but even with that off, it, it, there's just a lot of background noise, and the, the timbre and the tone, tone of my voice changed a lot. Um, so there's a, lot, there's a little bit of harshness in it. If I really start to speak up, um, there's some kind of boxiness, honkiness in it. I don't like that. Is that what I sound like? Um, so yeah, I turn this back on and that's a lot more pleasing. So it, 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 it kind of focuses it and, and tames the sound. So you're really only getting the important aspects of my speech. Um, and that's kind of the other part of this EQ curve. Whereas, um, you know, aside from the mic component itself and how sensitive it is, um, in a speech uh, application versus a musical vocal performance, um, you know, the, the EQ curve for a vocal performance was, was left a lot more broad. We, we had a lot more of the highs, of the highs and open. even the mids kind yeah. of left in there. And that's because when somebody's singing, they're going to be fluctuating through the range significantly throughout their performance. Yeah. When you're talking, when it's just speech, you're kind of just sitting in one kind of narrow frequency bandwidth. You're just kind of, you're, it's kind of very static. And, and stagnant, and you're not really fluctuating up and down the frequencies as much. So yeah. we don't need that all to be there. So we're trying to just kind of shave out as much as we possibly can, um, just to maintain the intelligibility of the microphone and the speech. Yeah, and um, I was sharing with you before we started this about, yeah. um, so I mix in a church uh, that I go to, and um, we don't have a touch mix, so I don't have access to that preset. And we have, you, you know, should, the, you should really get one. Man. I know. I know the, a guy. The message wanna... and the sermon, and you know, they they all use lav mics. Sure. And um, we have, you know, one kind of main pastor that that gives the main sermons and messages. But then we also have guests that are using the labs as well. Yeah. And some people have really uh, quiet voices. Yes. And some have super loud voices. Yeah. And everybody's and so different. Everyone's a little bit different. Um, so the, what I do is, in general, is I start with uh, a low cut at like 150 and a high cut um, around 15K. Uh -huh. And then um, so I'll cool. have the person that's wearing oh. it kind of, hey, us. let's give me, uh, give me some tests, you know, yeah. and then they start doing a thing. And then I just kind of raise the volume and kind of get a feel for where is the, where is the um, feedback Where's point. The, yeah. so, so our speakers are also... A little bit behind um, where the pastor stands, right. so it, it that's, that's can never be ideal. Super troublesome yeah. with regards to feedback, but basically, I'll you know bring up the volume and see you know how loud it needs where, to be, and then start where is doing some basic cutting. Yeah, find um, yeah find find where the feedback is. Yeah, yep, definitely. But labs are a pain. Labs are a pain. <laughs> yeah, um, and just to round off this preset, I really quickly want to just show you the, the compressor. We do also have a compressor setting for the lavalier. Um, one thing you'll notice kind of inverse to the EQ curve, which is a lot more aggressive than our musical application, our compressor settings are um, a lot more lenient, actually. We have, we have a significantly higher threshold, uh, as opposed to like 26 dB, I think, was the threshold on the vocal performance one. We've just got negative 11 here, which is a very, very mild, moderate uh, threshold level to kind of set yourself at. 
and our ratio is a 2.3 to 1 as, as opposed to 3 to 1. So we're not compressing as aggressively or as often as we were. Uh, and that is because, again, because of the nature of speech versus singing, um, you know, not only do you have the wide frequency fluctuations in a vocal performance, but you have very dramatic um, volume fluctuations. There's a singer can get very, very quiet and very, very, very loud in an instant. Again, when you're just talking, you're kind of maintaining more or less um, a consistent volume level throughout your, your talk. Um, so we don't really need to, uh, to, uh, to uh, compress it as aggressively. Um, we really kind of are just looking for just kind of like extreme, extreme peaks, kind of taming that. You know, if somebody gets really excited all, all at once, you, kind of, you don't want that to, to freak people out or, or sound bad in the PA. So we're kind of just have it set to catch that stuff. But in general, we're leaving the channel open um, and that allows it to sound a lot more natural. So, cool. Um, now, let's talk about some instrument stuff. Yeah. Um, or do you wanna, do you wanna address some of these questions? I think we're still about to address I think we are too. These questions. Now that we're starting to get into with instruments. instruments. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a look at a couple of instrument presets. I wanted to start with um, some drum presets in particular. I'm going to use my channel four for the rest of this. Uh, I want to check out uh, the, uh, a kick drum preset and a snare drum preset. So the two, the, the, the backbone to a drum set, the, the two elements that lay down your beat, your kick drum and your snare drum. Um, let's take a look at those. Uh, so for kick drum, we, yeah, let, let's quickly go through um, the next round of yeah. pre presets, and then I think it'd be fun to. Um, I just read some more. Yeah, of these there's questions. some good questions yeah, in yeah. here. I want to get to those. So quickly, um, there are two different com there are two different um, kick drum types. Actually, it's very rare to see uh, more than one uh, of a type category. Um, but basically, what this wants to know is, does your PA system have a subwoofer or not? So there's two different options here: kick no sub, kick with sub. So if you have a subwoofer, you choose the one with sub. If you don't, you choose the one with no sub. And that's going to tailor those presets a little bit differently based on your PA having a sub or not. I'm going to go ahead and stick with the no sub option. And I'm just going to go with the very, very generic kick no sub uh, preset here. I'm going to recall that on my channel four. And you'll notice that it does not have a comp indication at the end of it. It also doesn't have this GT indication. So if you see a preset that has a GT at the end of it, that means that there's a gate setting included in that. Um, and that, those settings, depending on what your stage setup is, can be very helpful in cutting down background noise and feedback as well. Quick, quick, quick. Okay. There's an info button oh, above good the preset, like on the preset page, there's an info right button. And that basically, for all the shorthand that's the label gives you, the info button gives you a full on. So just a couple of sentences. I pulled one up right there. So here's the info for our, what was that? I don't even know what that was. Kick no sub rock with a gate. So if I, if I okay, what does that mean? I hit info and I get an, another couple of sentences that further explains how it's going to set the channel up for. More this. details yeah. on what. So it yeah. says large diaphragm, dynamic mic in a drum head hole, uh, system with no subwoofer, more aggressive sound. So. Um, it, this preset is indication, indicating that it is f kind of geared towards a rock application, so it's it's going to be tailored for that a little bit more aggressive um, rock, that high energy sound. Um, okay, sticking with my just standard kind of more generic preset here, let's go ahead and take a look at our EQ curve for this. So there you go. So here's our kick drum EQ. Again, looks wildly different than either of the two vocal uh, EQs we just saw, um, namely in that we're missing our low cut here. So that is probably the most significant element of this is for, for the kick drum, we're not giving ourselves that low cut because a kick drum it has low frequency. We want that. We want that out of our kick drum. That's, that's where the, the meat is. That's the part that you feel in your chest yeah. you know, when, when it's hitting. So you don't want to get rid of that. Um, other than that, you know, on the other end here, um, m sort of might seem counterintuitive. Yes, of course, it's a kick drum. We want to hear the low end. But look, we have a boost actually in the high end as well. Um, and that is where the beater sound resides. So that is the sound, the kind of the click of the beater hitting the head. Um, and so that's going to give the, the definition to the sound. If you don't have that, that accent around that, the click, the beater sound, actually the striking of the drum, all you're going to get is that, that woofiness. Um, and it's just going to sound like this really muddy, like woofy sound in your mix. And it's not going to have that defined kick drum sound. So you want to have that up there. We also, we have this big cut here and that is taking out all of the the boxiness and sort of that kind of like a little bit of mud and sort of that that basketball sound if you've ever kind of 
I heard an un, a, a kick drum that has not been EQ'd at all. It has, sometimes it has this kind of hollowy kind of basketball bouncing sound. It's not pleasant. And that cut also gets it. That cut it. Is it 400 around? Yeah, 400. Right there. Yep, 400. So that's a very typical. Yeah. Cut 400. The boxiness that actually makes room for other things like yes. the bass guitar, um, some keyboards. Some vocals, like so. You're yeah. So you the kick drum frequencies is, are not like yeah. They're not on top of those yeah, um, on frequencies other things as well. that might want to occupy that space. So again, working together to create a, a mix where everything kind of has its own sonic space to shine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there you go. Um, and as I said, you know, we don't have a compressor or a gate setting on this particular preset. Um, and now that I, I actually don't think any of our drum presets include a compressor, um, and that is because typically compressors are used... Um, snare? There might be a, a one or two snare... It's, that it's have a pretty common. But um, yeah, it's but more, yeah. more common on a snare, less common on a kick drum, uh, um, in a live application anyway. But usually um, when you're using compressors on, on drums, it's more for um, sonic coloration than for functionality, because a drum typically doesn't have a very large dynamic range. It's kind of, it's, you, you, you hit it and it's, it's loud or it's not. So. Um, there you go. And just to touch on a gate real quick, this one doesn't have a gate setting, but depending on what your stage setup, if you, if you have a large stage setup um, with, a, with a large ensemble, we have a lot of open microphones on that stage, gates are going to be an additional tool as, aside from your, in addition to your EQ, that are going to help you significantly eliminate stage noise and mic bleed over and things like that, which can really kind of um, just, just muddy up the overall mix and cause your system to be much more prone to feedback. So yeah. two things you want to stay clear Gates of. Gates are awesome if you are kind of like always mixing yeah. and you can kind of tweak as you go. As you go, Cause, yeah. Because what a gate does is it automatically mutes um, or it's muted until until signal goes above a certain threshold, then it opens the channel. So it's yes. like an automatic mute going off and on. So like. It's a lot of times used in, in rock drums. Like 80s rock and roll drums are Compressed like to the teeth. Ga gated, gated, to the teeth, gated yeah. drums. So like all the tom mics are, and it's a really cool kind of theory on, are basically the gates are set to not be open until the drum gets hit. Yeah. So, so you know, you're playing groove and the tom mics are not. They're not even on. On, they're muted. They're yeah. basically gated. And so when you hit it, then it opens the gate and then it closes. Yeah. So you go to do your fill, <laughs> and as you're doing your fill, those microphones are popping on and then and then shutting right back off as you move down the toms. So. And it creates a really great, a really great sound. Yeah. However, if you have your gates improperly set, or if um, they can be always closed, they like can if, be. <laughs> if you have the threshold. If you have the threshold. Too, too high, low, too high. Yeah, yeah. It'll never disengage. Yeah. So, um, so gates are awesome to use. But I would say if you're, you know, if you're like a, an engineer like doing it all the time, there, I would say yeah, use them. But yeah. if you're mixing yourself, then I would be using them, use them sparingly. more sparingly. <laughs> yeah. Because you might, you might want to tweak them throughout. Yeah. Um, and then cool. one, one more quick uh, little tip on drums uh -huh. for live gigs. Um, in a lot of situations, uh, you might either not have enough mics or enough channels, or it's yeah. or it's a small enough place where you don't mic the whole kit. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's very very common. a lot of common. You know, the, I think the the way to go in a small restaurant or whatever is mic the kick drum, yep. and that's about all you need because sometimes that's it. Yeah, in a small place, when you when you do mic the kick. You get the like the beef comes through the PA. Yeah. Um, when when if you don't mic the kick, you hear it. But like once you're about ten or fifteen feet away from the drums, it disappears. You don't hear those lows. Yeah. Um, and so the drum, you it might does, it you just might doesn't still get the, as, the beater, but it's I mean it sounds very thin and papery. Yeah. At that point, it doesn't sound good. But like a snare drum, it's yeah. it's that'll cut. It's Your cymbals. Yeah, it's loud. You know, yeah. That'll cut through. Um, if you do need slightly more reinforcement, you know, beyond that kick microphone, maybe start with a single overhead yeah. just to kind of get more of the top end and, and the body of the kit. But, you know, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. Um, all right, should we take a look at the at the snare? Or should we? And quickly, Dean, I would not gate vocal channels um, no. unless uh, unless I guess one was never hardly being used. But when you're 
when you're singing all the time, I wouldn't because it, it it'll it, sound very unnatural. Yeah, you can hear you can channel. hear it coming off and on, and you'll yeah. hear audio. So I wouldn't I wouldn't gate vocals. Yeah, that's just yeah. stay away from that one. Um, okay, what do you think? Should we talk about the snare one a little bit, or just move right on to my next one? I was going to show was bass. There's some cool um, stuff going on in there. Yeah, let's talk about bass, and then we'll, and then we'll just take some questions. Is yeah. that cool? Yeah, that's cool with me. Uh, all right. We're going to take a look at and Thanks our, for hanging in, everyone. Yeah. Um, it's, it's great to, uh, hopefully that you guys find this interesting and maybe maybe might confirm or learn some stuff. Hopefully. <laughs> let's, uh, let's take a look at just the top one here. Bass DI, which stands for direct input. So that means that we're not, we don't have a, a, an amplifier that we have mic'd on stage. We're just taking the guitar directly uh, with the DI box into the mixer here. Um, and let's look at that. What's it going to do? I mean, also you will notice it's got the comp indication there, and so we we know we have a compressor setting with our EQ, and this is our EQ. So here we go, still pretty mild EQ curve actually, comparatively to what we've seen. Um, interestingly enough, uh, we are st we still have a low cut on the bass guitar, um, which, based on what I've been telling you, you might might have assumed that we were going to leave that off for the bass. Um, that's not the case here. We left it off for the snare or for the kick drum. Um, because the kick drum is a very, very quick, fast transient. A bass guitar has the ability to play very long, sustained, very low notes if you wanted it to. Um, and so that kind of, that, that low sustaining note, you want to have a, a cap on kind of how, where you, how far you want that to extend. Um, and we have it set very, very moderately. You know, that, we're cutting off at uh, 28. Point three, yeah, um, which is just a very, very, very bottom end of our hearing spectrum anyway, and so really all, all that's for, for is to keep some intelligibility in there, you know, to, to keep that low, that low wash, that low buildup from really getting too out of hand, um, both both sonically and um, to keep that from possibly damaging your equipment. You know, well, those. so what what happens at my church and a lot of places is low frequencies can build up. Yes, so it's it's cool to. Um, to roll off the extreme lows, like yeah. this is the like 20 hertz is a super low, but at least you know if if bass player plays an open B, low B string yeah. and just like bah, bah you know <laughs> whatever, then at least you're the able whole building to building yeah you it could you know it could kind of take off a yeah. little bit, but um but you're able to kind of like at least tame it, tame it a little bit right yeah yeah, yeah. so so we've got that going. We also have a, a slight cut here. And the reason for that is because that is where a lot of the kick drum energy, uh, energy yeah. is. And so we don't want, because the kick drum and the bass guitar are both low frequency instruments, we don't want them to fight with each other. We want them to both kind of shine and have their own sonic qualities that your ear can pick out. And so we kind of, we cut that part out of the bass just to give the kick drum uh, some area where it, where it can have a voice. And then the bass guitar kind of fills in around it. Uh, and then again, here we have this cut in the, upper mids there, uh, and that is the, again, the attack. So that's the, the sound of the pick on the strings or the player's fingers on, uh, striking the strings, um, and that just gives you the definition of the, of the drums. So we've got the low end plus the, the attack of the instrument put together gives you a nice, well-rounded yeah, sound. Yeah, this is kind of the intelligibility. Yeah. Um, kind of the, yeah. The, the thing about bass guitars that I've kind of, over the years, discovered is the, there's so many different instruments and so many different pickup types and yeah. stuff like that that there's not a real one size fits all. I mean, this is going to work. Not. That's why this is not, there's not much going there's on. There's not here. a lot. So, this is the, the standard kind of generic preset here. Yeah. But, like, and you know, sometimes you're dealing with bass players with pedal boards yep. and bass Effects. players playing with picks. Uh -huh. um, so, <laughs> we, we have a couple here. Um, that are specific for slap. So if, if you got a, a, a funk bass player that's he like heavy on the slap, we actually have presets specifically for that because it's going to dramatically change how the, how what the characteristics of the instrument are and how you know the how the EQ and the compressors might react to it. So yeah, I would just I would just say for bass, this is a great starting point for yep. most everyone, but. Um, it could be it could be a lot you could do stuff depending on who and what instrument um, absolutely like I, I, <laughs> I, I mix sound at um, boathouse mm -hmm. that we've played at together and the bass player had um, bass uh, fuzz, like a bass fuzz, a fuzz box, box yeah the whole time and wow. that's like <laughs> like yeah and so 
the resonant frequency that really like I found to where I could actually I had to boost and kind of like um, kind of find where where the, the actual frequencies were the energy was and it was a lot higher mm. than I thought. Interesting. It was in, it was kind of an interesting yeah. thing and I finally f- kind of found I'm like where's th- what's, where's the what's bass happening? Yeah. I want to like you know hear it better. And so I was trying to find it. So, that, that so it was in a frequency. different spot because he was using this crazy bass fuzz thing. Dang it. It was awesome, though. Did it have that on your cheat sheet? <laughs> crazy bass fuzz? <laughs> Where's know. that? Yeah. Um, all right, cool. So there you go. That was um, you know, a few of our presets kind of deconstructed. Let's go ahead. Um, we're we're, going, uh, uh, we're getting close to an hour here. So let's go ahead and start taking some of these questions. Real quick, this one. Teach me how to eject USB disk from the touch mix. Okay, so <laughs> there isn't, I like this one. There isn't uh, an official eject feature or whatever like that. So my what I do, um, you know, I mean, unless it's uh, unless I can't do this, my, my what I'm comfortable with is when I'm done recording or I know I'm, I've stopped the recording and I want to now take the drive out and, and do something else with it. Um, I power down the mixer. I'll just I'll just hit standby. I'll let it power down, and that way you know that it is shutting down all of its processes that may or may not have to do with that recording feature. And then you can safely you know, take the disk out without fear of yeah. interrupting some process or not, not having files not saved correctly or things like that. Yeah. That's what I do. Yeah, that's... that's what I would recommend. Um, you know, if you're in a situation where you, you need to take the drive out and it's still being used for audio and you, you can't shut it down, um, no, just you know, once you stop the recording, just count to 20. Just, just do a simple, just just do a countdown, because um, after about 20 seconds, it should be done doing whatever yeah. it needs to do. But but one thing that's really important, what you just said, is if you're recording to a disc, yeah, you have to hit the stop button. You do have to hit the stop button. <laughs> so or if else, you're recording and you're else, on your record screen, like the finished, the, there's a file that yeah. gets printed after you hit the the stop button. Yeah, um, that you need. Um, yeah, it's, it's, so there's a, a particular file. Once you hit the stop button, once the file is closed, um, it, another, uh, the TouchMix writes a very specific header file and attaches it to that recording. Um, if you pull the drive while it is actually still recording, that process doesn't get complete, that header file doesn't get written, right. and your, your file is essentially hosed. I mean, yeah. it's, and then for like um, saving scenes or presets mm-hmm. or whatever, I think it's just important to just wait, wait a few seconds. And I think if you are saving a scene, I know, I know at least if you're transferring a scene either onto a, a drive or onto the mixer, it'll tell you, you know, don't turn off the mixer for X number of seconds or something like that. So just just give it some time to kind of com- complete its processes before just yanking drives out. That would be my advice. And I want to say hi to Timo. He's in Finland Timo. right now. Oh, wow, Finland. Finland, Hi, it must be Tim. 10, 12 hours ahead. He, yeah. It must be 2 in the morning there. What are you um, doing, man? Insomnia, can't sleep? Wondering about... Glad you joined us. Master EQ tool called Room Tool or whatever. Room Tuning. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the Room Tuning Wizard is, is an awesome tool that you can use to tune your PA system to kind of flatten its frequency response to your physical acoustic space. So... Um, you know, your sound it lives in your mixer in a digital form. As soon as it exits your speakers, it's in, it's become, they become physical waves and they interact with the physical space around them. Um, and so that environment is going to inherently alter the characteristics of the waveforms slightly. It's, it's, not, a, it's not dramatic. Um, but tuning the PA system to match the, the frequency response of your actual physical space just kind of gives you a little step up on the sound overall sound quality and the ease of mixing. So we have a wizard. So there's a wizard in here. Yeah. Um, is there a video on it? Uh, How to do it? I don't know if we've done a video on this. All right. Actually. Well, let's uh, show where the wizard so, is and so give kind of a little overview of how it works. In here. So you're gonna press yeah. the. You can't see it because of my zoom, but um, there's a physical right right next to where you see us in the screen. If you're looking at a touch mix, there will be a button that says wizard. You're going to press that, and that's going to give you this screen. So we have three wizards in total. Um, you're going to select the tuning wizard, and you get here. Um, and so you have the option to tune either your, your main output, so whatever speakers are connected to the main output, or any of your monitors. Um, and you have a couple of options on different precision settings. I'll talk about that in a minute. But basically what's, it's going to happen is you're, you want what's known as a measurement microphone. 
If you're not familiar with what that is, just look it up online. Um, but if, if you've ever seen a microphone that kind of has like a weird needle point, it kind of, instead of, you know, a big <laughs> diaphragm like this, it kind of tapers down to, to a very small point at the end of it. Yeah. That's called a measurement microphone. Um, ideally, you use one of those with this process. We don't recommend using just like a standard microphone. You can, um, but you'll get a lot better results with an actual measurement microphone. Um, so you're going to connect that to the talkback channel on your mixer, and then come into this screen here and hit next. You hear that? As soon as I did that, it disabled our microphones, okay? So um, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But essentially what, what, what it does is it the next screen is going to give you a little diagram. Um, and it's going to be like, look, if, you're, if your PA speakers are here, put the mic here. It's going to show you kind of approximately where to put the mic in, in space in relation to where your speakers are. And then you hit begin. And it's going to play pink noise out of your PA at a pretty moderate volume. You might Which wanna... sounds like this. <laughs> it's like static, <laughs> like TV static. That's called pink noise. Um, it, it's moderately loud when it does this, so you might want to issue a warning to the room before you do it. Um, and it, it listens to that for about 20 seconds. And it calculates, so it, it knows what that pink noise sounds like digitally, internally. Pink and noise is also all the frequencies across, I don't know, 20, I always forget, 20 hertz to 20k, something like that. So there's like a that. difference between pink noise and white noise, and I constantly forget that difference, so I'm not going to, I don't want to be wrong. But it's a range of but, frequencies, yes. like a wide range of all at the same time. All at the same time. So the microphone hears so it. So it can hear everything that's happening, and it can hear, so it hears what, it's, what it sounds like coming out of the speakers, and it knows what it's supposed to sound like, and it compares the two, and then offers you an EQ curve to flatten that and, yeah. and make that the same. It's, it's, it's pretty insane, it's actually. Pretty, yeah. It's pretty cool. So that's the Tuning Wizard. Um, if you get a chance to use it, it's, it's, a, it's a great tool to take advantage of. It's, it's a great, this is a, that's a great tool if you're, you, you install a system yeah. and you want to tune the room and then it's like you're really tweaking it. And then it. you're really dialed it in. If you go from gig to gig to gig to gig, unless you have time, to really set up mics and stuff, it, that's, that's, that's yeah. one of those things. But anyway. Okay, a couple other questions that are kind of coming in hot here. <laughs> uh, does the RTA button show the live signal in the background? Yes, it does. So I can go to the RTA on my lav mic. RTA on. Uh -oh, there we go. There we go. So there, there's the RTA. So that is showing in real time uh, what, what my voice, what frequencies... Oh wow! What's what's interesting? Okay, when I'm looking at this, the RTA is is mostly in the area where all the cuts are happening. So that is yeah. So the RTA is post EQ. So if I turn the EQ off, now the RTA is representative of what my voice sounds like now. And I turn it back on, and there you go. So now we got nothing down here. We got very little up there, um, and so it's just you can really see what what my voice sounds like That's after cool. the EQ. Um, Joseph says his left channel is louder than his right. Uh, for that one, I would get in touch with our AET department. Uh, we've got... Our we've tech got a, support. Yeah, tech support. support. Um, so it could be, though, it also, his question could be that I'm louder than you or you're louder than me because our mics are panned a little bit they left, are. left and right. So Is that what you're talking about? I don't about? know if his mixer is behaving that way or if our mixer is hmm. behaving that way. <laughs> if it's ours, I apologize. <laughs> uh, what, what do you got here? Does tuning, okay, so this is a good one. Does tuning the room help prevent feedback from microphone if singers walk in front of the speakers? No, it does not. Um, <laughs> for, for that, um, that, I mean, the tool that you would want to use to try and help that would be the and, feedback and a and feedback system. Um, but the best defense against that is to tell your singers not to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Walking, uh, an open microphone in front of the speaker is... It's, that's just bad. It's just you're, you're going to get feedback more often than not, especially at high volumes. You know what we need to do in a, in a, in a tech talk coming up is we need to do the anti-feedback wizard live. I've, I've, I've done it in my webinars. We, we certainly could do it here. Yeah, it's, I think it would be great. It's a super cool, easy, effective demo. But what's cool is, theoretically, is you get all the microphones live on stage mm -hmm. in, about, in about kind of usable volume. Yep. And then, um, and then for each monitor, mm -hmm. you you run this wizard. You run the wizard. 
and it basically turns up all the mics until it hears until feedback, feedback, and then it starts cutting those automatically. Yeah, those frequencies automatically, and it creates a situation to where if singer is holding the mic and then puts the mic down by accident or whatever, it it it, it probably won't it feedback. It won't feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or hopefully it won't feedback. It's, <laughs> it provides a a, a a large cushion yeah. in which. You know, you're safe from feedback. It's a pretty effective tool it's as well. It's amazing. It's really impressive to watch it work too. Um, we'll definitely do that in a, in a future. Okay, Joseph, it's your mixer. So yeah. if your left and right outs are dramatically different, which it's possible, it could be a hardware. It could be a hardware thing. You definitely get in touch with our, our tech support, and they yeah. can they can get that taken care of for you. Yeah. Um, and I go up here. Which measurement microphone would you recommend? Um, there are. Any, anything, whatever you can afford. There are, there are many different manufacturers that make measurement microphones and they range from about $100 to $2,000. So um, anyone in that, you don't need a super expensive one. So just kind of whatever, whatever you're comfortable with, just pick that up and they all work pretty well. I've got an awesome question from Loop Over Band. Okay. I sing backing tracks. I have, lead, I have a lead mini jack into my iPad Pro and two guitar jack into channel one and two linked. Would you EQ iPad backing tracks and what settings? Hmm, backing tracks, uh, so is it, so here, is it like break, like break music or, or is it like tracks that you're playing along to? Yeah, I don't know. But my, my kind of response when I hear backing tracks, yeah. um, if they're all very similar with regards to EQ volume and all mm -hmm. that stuff. You can kind of treat them as a group. Yeah. But if but if your backing tracks are kind of all over the map, yeah. Then it's then it's difficult, you know. It's um, very difficult. Um, and in general, backing tracks I would leave flat. I would if, leave flat if they're if they're kind of like mixed and mastered and they're professionally made. Yeah. Um, that, that works. That means that's already done. You so you don't that means EQ no them. EQ. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, where can we get that QSC T-shirt? <laughs> uh, this is limited edition, uh, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, and unfortunately, like we have this, we've tried to do apparel stores on our website. I can say this because I'm in the marketing department. <laughs> and um, man, we were we were getting close to releasing one until, and then COVID hit, and now we're all working from home. So, yeah. we, hopefully, we will be able to sell apparel, QSC apparel, at some point in We're the hoping. near future. Uh, let's see. Andre. Solo vocalist. From Canada. All over genres. Oh. So, yeah. Um, I wouldn't EQ your backing tracks. Yeah. yeah I'd leave them, leave, leave them flat. EQ your vocals. Um, and sing that. Um, if you think of that from, like, a karaoke point of view, you know, um, you got to, in a karaoke rig, you've got your, your tracks, that you're singing along to that are already done, that are already kind of built and, and mixed. And then you have your karaoke microphone and you're probably gonna put a lot of EQ and a lot of reverb and stuff on that. Um, but you're, the tracks you're singing to are, have no EQ while you're performing to them. So it's kind of, that, that's a good example to, to compare that to. The other thing too is if backing tracks are low res, like I was just, now I'm thinking about low res backing tracks, they can yeah. get kind of harsh sounding. So yeah. you could you could kind of experiment with cutting a little bit of the 2K with like a, a, um, wide, uh, yeah. Q, a wide Q, right. just a little bit to kind of soften them if they sound harsh. But if they sound good, just I wouldn't EQ them. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah leave them open, leave them flat. Um, cool, good stuff here. I mean, ah, I'm trying to scroll up. And, uh, Cool. I, I feel like we should probably call it a day. I think so. We've been at this for a little <laughs> over an hour. This is supposed to be like 20 minutes. <laughs> but it's so. great to have you guys all, uh, you know, contributing and asking questions and stuff. And we're going to try to do this every other week on Thursdays. Um, so, um, yeah, hopefully you yeah, hopefully we'll, find it back. interesting. There um, are two, and you actually, just real quick, there are yeah. a, a couple other questions that I, I'll, I'll address before we go. Um, See, Andre asked earlier, I would like for you to give us some nice vocal reverb settings for male vocal. Ah, great. Reverb. Question. So real quick. Um, There's a wizard for yeah. that. There's a wizard for that. <laughs> okay, so if I go back to my wizards page with the wizards button here, we have this effects wizard right there, which is really cool. Um, it can help you, kind of guide you with the, similar to what our preset menu look like. 
it can guide you towards um, effects and effect settings that are kind of applicable to what you're trying to get. Um, so if we start in the source here, we go to vocals, and we go to, what did he, and he said it was a, just male vocals, nice vocals. Like, we'll, we'll go ahead and call it a lead vocal. I'll select lead vocals here. Um, and then we've got all these options in the effects <laughs> preset. Your right hand is better My, at yeah, touching right? than your left hand My, right now. I have touch capacitive <laughs> fingers on this hand. Um, so all of these here indicated by a D or an L are going to be all your reverbs. All right, he's turning the knob right now, by the way. And yes, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm spinning the dial, the, the big encoder dial to, to navigate this menu here. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say a good place to start would be this one, the, the dense live plate medium or the uh, lush vocal plate two. Those are two of my personal favorites. They sound awesome, depending on kind of your, your style. Yeah. Um, but I would start with one of those and maybe pick one, see what it sounds like, and then go to the other one and hear what the differences are um, and start there. So what you're going to want to do is recall one of them. So now that I've got it set on Lush Vocal Plate 2, I'm going to hit the green recall button and I'm going to confirm it. So now it's going to... Oh, wait. So yeah, so it set up my effects one here. So you can see my, my four different effects um, masters up here. So I just engaged my... I, I recalled the this reverb on my effects one and now I want to assign it to a vocalist and so I can just go ahead and put it right on my male vocal channel that I already set up right there and that's it and you're done and so what's ever loaded on each of the effects yes. tabs you can just kind of select you which channels put you it want where to you want it. add so, those and yeah. that's it now if you actually go back into the channel itself in the effects tab here now we can see okay so I, we've given it that amount of my effect one, which we loaded as the lush uh, plate two. Yeah. Um, so if you think, so if you like the way that sounds great, if you think it might need a little more wetness, you need a little more reverb, you can. Um, let's, let's do this. Let's mess with this. Hello. Hey, can we hear that? Okay. If you want this to go up, yeah. Hear that? Hear the reverb on my voice now? That's extreme. That's crazy. Do you hear Huge it? reverb. Uh, and then if we dial it back. You can kind of you can kind of pick and choose what, uh, uh, the amount that we want, but it's gonna the wizard is gonna kind of give us um, a starting point. A go says, okay, cool. We're gonna we're gonna throw it to this amount. What does that sound like? If you need to adjust it, you can come back into the channel and adjust it like that. Yeah. Um, so that would be my advice. I, I would start with one of those two presets and kind of play with it from there. See what you get. I'll also mention if you just you know when you get the mixer out of the box or you load the default um, scene or the factory reset, um, the reverbs that are selected in there now, there's a, um, a reverb, two reverbs and a delay, I think, are in three of the four slots. And those are pretty standard usable um, reverbs and delays yes. for most applications. So, so you can just kind of like mess with those mess with ones them, yeah. and change like the, the um, the reverb length and the size and yeah. just kind of mess with those first and then load a different we, one I mean, and kind of see we how. You go goes. ahead and, yeah. and just call it out. Like these are these the two reverbs on here are modeled directly after um, a very specific Lexicon and Yamaha uh, like actual rack processor that that have been wildly popular for decades. So we we directly modeled those. Um, hardware reverbs, as well as a lot of the presets that were in them as well. And, and the one, the one, the two that I directed you to are actual presets that we modeled after the presets that are in the real physical models of these um, processors. So it's 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 great stuff. It's really really cool sounding. Um, I feel like we could do a great a great we tech should. talk we should. just on reverbs and delays. So I also want to throw this out there. We do we have to get, to get offline really yeah. soon. That we still got questions coming in, but. Um, so a couple of questions that came in recently that I can maybe redirect you to somewhere else for the information is um, somebody asked, um, somebody said that they were a DJ and they have a touch mix and are wondering if you need any other equipment or any other processors with this. The answer, uh, the short answer is no, you don't. Um, but I actually did an entire webinar where I discuss um, using TouchMix specifically in DJ, DJ applications. And you can find that on YouTube if you just search um, QSC Interactive Webinar TouchMix for DJs. I know that's probably a really long title, but go to our channel. Go there's to our a channel. Playlist for the webinar. Yes, there's a webinar yeah. playlist on our channel, and you'll find it in there. That can be very helpful. Um, and then we've got a bunch somebody, of videos somebody asks, on, on TouchMix um, as well. Is it possible to record on two separate drives at the same time? No, it is not. 
You can record one drive at a time. So there you go. OK. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Jason, yeah, thanks, man. dude. This was super fun. <laughs> Let's do it again. Let's do it again. All right, All right. we'll do this again in two weeks. Thanks, everybody. See and uh, everyone, have a nice day. Thanks for tuning in. All right. Later. <laughs>